Thank you, Avril. Um, I would just like to dedicate this shiur to the memory of um, three people's great grandmother here. One great grandmother for three people in one shear. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, Marcel and Jeffrey and myself, uh, our great grandmother uh, had a York site yesterday uh, whose name was Rivka Bat, I think Yitzchak. Is that right, Marcel? Yeah? Rivka Bat Yitzchak? No, Marcel's looking blank. Jeffrey's nodding. Okay, so in the memory of Rivka Bat Yitzchak, our mutual great grandmother, whose 80th York site it was yesterday. Um, and um, so we'll dedicate that, the Sheol, to her memory. Um, I bet that's the first time in 80 years she's ever had a Sheol uh, dedicated in her memory. But there you go. Never, it's never too late. Um, also, a refuah shleima to uh, Bernard Oldsborough, who's not well um, and um, is hopefully on the mend. But we wish him a refuah shleima and we dedicate uh, some of the learning to uh, a refuah shleima for him. OK. Binyamin ben Sarah Malka. I think it's Binyamin ben, ben, ben. Binyamin ben Sarah Malka. Thank you. I think so. OK, thank you. Right. Let's get cracking. The title of this uh, of this shiur is What's the Point of Pesach? Um, and... It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek question, obviously, because we all have some uh, um, idea. Everybody will have their own ideas, I guess, of what the point of Pesach is for them. Um, my wife used to get, still gets a bit um, uh, upset every year when she gets out her Pesach uh, recipe book, because uh, back in Manchester, um, many years ago, I, I'm not sure which organisation it was, one of the organisations sold a... Um, a recipe book for Pesach, um, which has got, apparently, not that I would know about these things, has got some excellent recipes in. But why did my wife get upset about it every year when she took out the uh, uh, book? Because it was called, somebody obviously thought it was funny. My wife didn't think it was funny. Uh, it, it was called, this book, Oh No, Not Pesach, uh, this little recipe book. Um, uh, and Ellie never gets upset every year when she looks at that because she says, how can you say such a thing? Oh, no, not Pesach. Pesach is such a wonderful thing. It's such a wonderful holiday. It's got so much meaning, so much memories for all of us, and uh, memories that we're creating for the next generations, hopefully. Um, the, 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 I know it was only said tongue-in-cheek, but even tongue-in-cheek, oh, no, not Pesach. Uh, that's not the point of Pesach. The point of Pesach is not to come into Pesach thinking, oh, God, not Pesach. I've got to eat matzah for seven days and... Uh, and I can't have Marmites or whatever it is. Uh, uh, and it's, no, that's not the point of Pesach. So what is the point of Pesach? What's, I'm going to look at this from a textual uh, perspective. And those of you who are familiar with our Shiorim will know that we look at the Psukim, we look at the verses in the, uh, in the Torah and in Tanakh very carefully uh, in an attempt to uh, try and gain as much as we can in terms of insight of what the inner messages are. And I want to start um, with, uh, actually, the end of Pesach. Um, strangely enough, I want to start with the uh, uh, end of Pesach. Uh, you all know the story. I'm not giving you any spoilers here when I tell you that there were 10 plagues and then... Uh, uh, God took the Jews out of uh, Egypt. I guess you probably all know that. So let's start uh, our questioning uh, at the beginning of Parshat B'Shalach. Uh, and this is after the B'nai Israel have left uh, Egypt. And we read, and it's in chapter, uh, what chapter is it in? It's in chapter 13 of Shemot. Uh, at the beginning of Parshat Bashalach, chapter 13, verse 17. It should be on the screen for you now. Uh, and I'm going to ask Leon to uh, read from verse 17 onwards, please. It happened when Pharaoh sent out the people that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines because it was near. For God said, perhaps the people will reconsider when they see a war and they will return to Egypt. So God turned the people toward the way of the wilderness, to the Sea of Reeds. The children of Israel 
were armed when they went up from Egypt. Okay, let's stop there. Um, so this is the beginning of Parashat Mashalach. They've left Egypt. This is before the splitting of the Red Sea, of course. Uh, and we have this very strange, uh, very, very strange tuk in here. What does it say? When Pharaoh sent out the people, it says on here in the, on this translation, when Pharaoh let the people go, not a good translation. Uh, Leon's translation was much better. Uh, we all know what a shaliach is. A shaliach is somebody who is sent. Um, so it's much better translation that Leon said when Pharaoh sent the people out. Hashem did not lead them. Um, Hashem did not lead them the way of the Philistines because it was near. Because God said, what happens in case the people will see a war and they'll return to Egypt? So God led the people into the desert towards the Red Sea. There's some lots of things that's wrong with that. Looking. We've just seen God do 10 plagues. We've just seen the power of God uh, to do whatever he wants, to upside down nature, to do all sorts of weird things like turning water into blood and thick darkness and locusts and frogs and death of the firstborn, all those things. And he's worried that the people might see a war and return to Egypt. Well, certain, why, why would they be worried about that? They've got God on their side. They come to a war, God will win the war for them. And so what? They don't, what's going on here? That's not question number one. And what does it mean when it says that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, Ki Karovhu, because it was near? So what? Why should that, that make any difference, whether it was near or far? And when it says, lest the people see a war, which war are they, are they talking about here? Um, and thirdly, thirdly, this is a very strange uh, uh, expression. And the children of Israel were armed when they went about of Egypt. There's a non sequitur there. If, though, if God is worried that they're going to see war and get frightened, then why are we told that they were armed? You would think they would be frightened if they weren't armed. So that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So there's a lot of questions to answer uh, on these. Two Johnny, questions. Johnny, soldiers, even if they're armed, even if they're uh, uh, overarmed, uh, are scared. Fear is a, is a normal emotion. Okay, but if you're, going to, if you're going to give an impression that a people are frightened, you might say, although they were armed, you might say, uh, uh, or oh, they weren't armed. It's just vachamushim, and they were armed. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't fit in. The fact that we're told that they were armed doesn't fit in with these psukim. We'll come back to it later. All right. We'll come back to it later. Um, so, um, so those are the three questions. Now I've got another question for you. Next word, Elohim derech eretz plishtim. If Ruby was here, he would be able to tell us that. If I asked him this question, how many times is the name Elohim used in the Torah from the time of the burning bush when we are introduced to Hashem as the the name Yud K Vav K, the name that we are used to uh, used used to seeing as God, our God, Hashem, Yud K Vav K. How many times after the burning bush until this point do we see the name Elohim? Anybody want to have a guess? Eighteen oh, times. Sorry. How many? Eighteen. No, the answer is none. OK, none. OK, whenever we encounter God. Hashem el Moshe Leimor. Hashem el Aharon. Hashem el Moshe. It's always Hashem. From the time of the burning bush until here, we do not see the name Elohim. Here, all of a sudden, we see the name Elohim. Now, there's a difference. The name Hashem, Yudke Vavke, 
is the name um, which is given to God when he's our personal God, as it were. He's the God of the Jews. And Elohim is the international name of God. OK, that's the, the we use the name Elohim when we're talking about the whole world. So uh, Bereshit, Bara, Elohim. OK, Elohim created the world, not Hashem. I mean, it's the same entity, I guess. But the name Elohim is the international name. Why is the international name here being used instead of the name Hashem, which has been used all the way through in this whole story up till now? OK, now, the second question I want to ask you is this. The second additional question I want to ask you is if I were to ask you a question, what was the uh, um, first, not the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal of the Exodus was to bring us to Eretz Canaan. OK, what was the initial goal of the Exodus? What was the initial point of Yitziat Mitzrayim? What was meant to, to happen next? Freedom from slavery. OK, freedom from slavery. All right. And then what? Going directly to the land of Israel that was promised. OK, Sharon says going to the land of Israel, and that's what was the ultimate goal. That is true. But there was something on the way that happened on the way, which we knew was going to happen on the way. What am I referring to? Yes, Jeffrey. You're muted. The giving Jeffrey. of the Torah. The giving of the Torah. Correct. The giving of the Torah. The, and how do we know that that is the ultimate goal? Uh, sorry, not the ultimate goal, the first goal. Well, we read it, didn't we, in chapter three of Shemot. Chapter three of Shemot. There it is on the screen for you. This is before the Exodus now. God says to. Um, who's, who's got noise on? Please mute. Thank you. Um, we see here. What does uh, Hashem say here? Verse 12, Leon. And he said, for I shall be with you. And this is your sign that I have sent you. When you take the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. And where did that take place? That story, that was at the burning bush, which was at Har Sinai. So if I go back to Beshalach, and it says here, when Pharaoh let the people go, he, uh, when he sent them out, God did not lead them, by the way, in the land of Philistines, for it was near. And because he was worried they would see war and return to Egypt. So he took him down, they took him round to the desert. Those two psukim indicate that the reason they went into the desert was to avoid war by a different route. But we've just said that in the first place, they were going to go to the, the desert. The whole plan was then to go to the desert. So why in Bashalach are we now being told, oh, it's, you know, I was thinking of taking a, a direct route, but I've changed my mind because I don't want them to have war. No, that's not true, because our Pasuk over there in Shemot, uh, chapter three that I just showed you, um, tells us that the plan all along in the first instance was to take them into the desert to this very mountain, to the desert, to Har Sinai. Let's have a look at a map. Can you see that map on the screen? Give me a nod, somebody, yeah. Okay, so here's the land of Goshen, where the people uh, uh, were living. And this is the natural way to get to uh, Eretz Canaan, to the land of Canaan. And this is, Derech uh, Eretz Pelishtim, towards the land of the Philistines. Where was the Philistine stronghold? We all know this from the Tanakh Shir, don't we? Aslan, Gaza, Ashdod, uh, Lachish, uh, and Gat, all down here in the south. So you can see that the way into uh, Israel is here. And that is what God's referring to in Bashalach. He says, I decided not to take them that way in case they came against war and then they got frightened and they went back to Egypt. So if that was the plan, hang on a minute, what about Mount Sinai? You told me before the Exodus 
that you're going to bring them over here to Mount Sinai to give them the Torah. And now you're telling me that really you were going to take them over here. And it's only because we're frightened of war that we decided to take them back. So the fact that we got to Sinai was a sort of an accident. It's an accident we got to Sinai because really we weren't meant to go anywhere near Sinai. We were meant to go straight to Eretz Canaan uh, through the Derech Eretz Palestine towards the land of the Philistines. That black uh, dotted line there is the way we were meant to go. And because of the, the secondary fear of war, we ended up going on the red arrow. And as it so happens, we managed to get to Sinai. But that doesn't fit, does it? There's something not right here. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, the two psukim in, uh, in the first instance, this one here that says, I'm going to take you out of Egypt and you will worship God on this mountain, is not consistent with these psukim here, verse 17, uh, Bashalach, that they took them by the did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines because it was near, because they were frightened of war. So that's a very serious question that we need to answer uh, as to what's going on uh, here. All right. So those are the questions. Now we have to come to some answers. Now, um, let's have uh, the, the basic assumption um, in all the traditional uh, explanations of this is that God wanted to avoid all potential confrontations of war, uh, at least at the beginning, until the people had, had come out of their slave uh, mentality a bit. Uh, but why? Because he's worried that they're going to see war and return to Egypt. Now, why would they return to Egypt? Why would they return to Egypt? Because Egypt was the superpower. This is what we were talking about a bit yesterday in the show yesterday. Egypt was a superpower. Let me just show you, if I can, um, the, uh, let's see, I've got it ready somewhere. I think it might be that one. Yes, there it is. That is the extent of the uh, Egyptian empire at the time of the Exodus. The Exodus was around about the 14th century BCE. This map is the 15th century BCE, it's the, the best one I could do. You can see uh, the extent of the Egyptian empire, which includes, look, it includes Sinai, Canaan, Syria. All of the Holy Land is under the control of Egypt. Now that's a very important fact, which we will come back to in a moment. Let's just leave that on for a second. So, um, number one, the question is, why would they go back to Egypt? They would go back to Egypt because they had no choice. They would be taken back to Egypt. And the second thing is, um, just go back over here to this, to Bashalach. God led the people around by the way of the desert um, uh, to the Red Sea. And the idea was that they would avoid war. But what happened, actually? What happened was they were immediately confronted by war. The Egyptians chased them out and they um, trapped them between the chasing Egyptian army and the Red Sea. So, first of all, how could God go back on his word and say, I wanted you to, to, to serve me at Sinai? And then change his mind. No, I'm going to take you the, the, the short route. No, I'll change my mind. I'll go back down into the desert because I want to avoid war. And actually, it doesn't avoid war at all. It just doesn't fulfill its, its stated goal. Its stated goal was to avoid war so that they won't return to Egypt. So um, we've got a big problem with that, really. Let's have a look at um, Shemot chapter 14 now. Um, Verse 10, Leon, please, chapter 14. Pharaoh approached the children of Israel, raised their eyes, and behold, Egypt was journeying after them, and they were very frightened. The children of Israel cried out to Hashem. They said to Moses, were there no graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the wilderness? What is this that you have done to us to take us out of Egypt? Is this not the statement that we made to you in Egypt saying, let us be and we will serve Egypt? 
for it is better that we should serve Egypt than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand fast and see the salvation of Hashem that he will perform for you today. For as you have seen Egypt today, you shall not see them ever again. Hashem shall do battle for you and you shall remain silent. Okay, so uh, here we see immediately that there is war and in fact, God fears, in inverted commas, that the people will complain and want to go back to Egypt are actually correct, aren't they? Because the people, what do the people say? Why have you taken out of Egypt? We said, leave us there and we'll serve the Egyptians. It's better that we'll serve the Egyptians than that we'll die in the desert. So in one respect, God's fears was, was, was correct, that they would uh, be frightened of this war and want to go back to Egypt. But taking them round into the desert made it worse because they got them trapped. He got them trapped between the Egyptian army, which was chasing, and the sea in front of them. So um, we've got some problems here that we need to, uh, we're, we're missing something. That's the point. We're missing something. Rashi says, uh, let's go back to Bashalach. Rashi says, Kikarov, uh, who, because it was near, if something is near, but it's easy to go back to. That's Rashi. Rashi says it's, it was it was if you went the 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 quick route up here, well, it would be easy to go back. The first sign of trouble will just nip back to Goshen. It would be easy. That's what Rashi says. But uh, uh, Rashbam um, says no. Uh, it, what it means is Kikarov, who because it's close, it's too close to Israel. They're not ready yet psychologically. They weren't ready to enter the land. Because although you could take the uh, Israelites out of Egypt, they hadn't yet taken Egypt out of the Israelites. We spoke about this yesterday as well. They still had a slave mentality. And it took 40 years to get that slave mentality out of them before they were ready to enter the land. So Kikarovu, according to the Rashbam, means they weren't ready yet. They had to spend time, if you like, doing their time growing up, getting a new generation. Uh, uh, who were uh, the, the, new Israel, the new Israelites who were not born to slavery before they could enter uh, the land of Israel over here uh, um, 40 years later. That's according to the Rashbam. Um, and um, the, Ram, the Ramban says that the reason that they, were, they, they went this way is not because they were frightened of war per se, but the war particularly with the Pelishtim, the Philistines, have a look again. God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, for it was near, because God said, lest the people reconsider when they see war. The Ramban says it was the Philistines they were particularly worried about, uh, because they were a particularly unpleasant bunch. But there's a problem with that, because who did they encounter after Egypt had been drowned? Almost immediately after the giving of the Torah, who did they encounter? Yes, Jeffrey? Amalek. Amalek, and they were worse. You know, it reminds me of, of my father's favourite joke. You know, his brother was worse. Uh, uh, Amalek were worse than Plishtim. Uh, and so so uh, well, the Ramban's explanation is, is a little bit difficult to understand as well. So we need to have a, a, another look at this all together. Um, and the, uh, the, the way we look at this is as follows. If you have a look at um, that map that I showed you, uh, let's see if I can find it again. There we go. So uh, here's the map of the Egyptian uh, empire. What you will see um, is that the, the land of Canaan was an Egyptian uh, vassal state. So what would have happened had they gone uh, through this area here, through the, the normal short direct route into Israel, they would have gone all the way through this green area, which is the Egyptian empire. So they would have been, uh, as it were, a vassal state. But remember, they had, they had permission, permission from Pharaoh. Did you ever think for a minute, why did, was God so fussed 
that Pharaoh would let them go. Why didn't he just take them out? Why didn't he just either kill Pharaoh, paralyze him, do something to him and let them take them out? What's all this business? Let my people go. Why do we need permission from the Goyim to go? Why didn't Hashem just take us out? What's all this business with Pharaoh needs to let us go? Uh, and, and eventually, what does he say? He says, here, go, get out. And presumably, he gave them a letter of safe passage. Right? Pharaoh says, get out of here. Here's a letter of safe passage. So what happens is they come to the border. They come to the border. Let's go back over here. They come to the border here uh, with uh, the Philistine land, which is uh, uh, part of the Egyptian uh, empire. And they give over their letter of safe passage from Pharaoh. They're still uh, a subordinate to Pharaoh. What happens if they lose their letter? Right. It gets lost on the way. Uh, they can't find it. They get to the border. Where's your letter of safe passage from Pharaoh? Can't find it. Right. Well, then you're, you're, you're slave labor. You get back to Egypt. They're not fully independent if they do that. They're not fully independent. They will be part of the best that they would be, would be a vassal state. So the theory uh, that I want to put forward in front of you is not that they were going into the desert to avoid war, but God took them by way of the desert to avoid war with the Philistines. Yes, because what he wanted was an all out war with Egypt. He actually wanted God wanted us to see Egypt dead on the seashore. What do we say every morning before Shirat Hayam? The people saw the hand, great hand of, of, of God. And what did they see? Mitzrayim met al Sfatayam. They saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore, on the shore of the Red Sea. They had to see, according to this theory, the point of taking them into the desert, to taking them into a situation was that they did have war, but not with the Philistines, but with the Egyptians. They had to be completely freed up from uh, the, the Egyptians. They had to be completely independent from them. And the only way they could do that was to have a war and to win that war and see them dead on the seashore. Because otherwise, because of this green situation here, they will, even when they got to Israel, they would still be subordinate to Egypt because they were the controlling power. They, and at the moment, they were still in that mentality because they just spent a whole year trying to get permission from Pharaoh. And what's going on here? That God didn't just take them out. God made sure that Pharaoh gave them permission. They still have that mentality of slaves. And so the idea here in this Pasuk is that they should actually see war. And therefore, it makes sense that they were told that they were armed because the war was coming for against Egypt, not against the Palestinian. Uh, somebody had their hand up. Who was it? Johnny. Yes. Yeah, how many were the Israelites? Oh. oh, you always ask the awkward question, Johnny. Uh, the, the, according to the Torah, give me there was an awkward answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll give you the answer I always give you. Uh, the, 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 according to the Torah, there were six hundred thousand yeah. men, uh, which equates to about two or three million people. There's a famous Rashi that on this particular Pasuk, the Chamushim Alu Bnei Israel, that uh, they, they were armed. It also alludes to the fact that only one fifth of them left Egypt and four fifths of them didn't deserve to leave Egypt and that they went, they, they died in the plague of darkness, which would mean that the total population of the Jews in Egypt was 10 million people. And they lived in this little land of Goshen here, 10 million people, when the uh, total population of the entire world was only about 40 or 50 million anyway. So the numbers don't stack up, OK? But there was a lot of them. 600,000 is a figure that the Torah use uh, 
uh, uses to denote a lot. So when I say to you, uh, it's a million miles away, it's not really a million miles away, it's just a long way. OK, so uh, there were a lot of them. Is the answer to your question is a lot. OK. But did they actually uh, fight the Egyptians? I thought they crossed the Red Sea and they drowned. They didn't fight the Egyptians. That's right. But they didn't know that at this stage. At this stage, uh, what, what, what they had to do was they had to see that the Egyptians were no longer their masters. And the only way you could do that was to have a war with them. OK, God fought the war for us. But we had a war with them and we were victorious. So the idea here is that he didn't leave, lead the way of the Philistines because he wanted them to go into war. Uh, with Egypt. So God led the people round by the way of the desert to the Red Sea and the children of Israel were armed when they went up out of Egypt, ready for a fight. As it so happens, uh, God did the fighting for them, but they were ready for a fight with Egypt. And that's the important bit. And the, the bit I want to concentrate on now is this. Veshavu Mitzrayma, and they will return to Egypt. What's so bad about that? Well, there's a halacha, actually. That it is forbidden to go and live in Egypt. Did you know that? It's forbidden to live in Egypt. You are not allowed to go and live in Egypt. The Shavu Mitzrayma is a, uh, is a, uh, a mitzvah in the Torah. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and there are various places where we see that from. And I'm going to show you a few of them quickly uh, now. Um, returning to Egypt re doesn't just mean to live. It means seeking the support of Egypt, who represent, represents the superpower. And I'm going to show you, first of all, uh, uh, in Tanakh, expressions where we're shown that that is something we're not allowed to do. Let's have a look in Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 31, Leon, verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and who rely on horses. They trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. And they did not depend on the Holy One of Israel and did not seek out Hashem. Keep but going. he is also. But he is also wise and he has brought calamity and he did not retract his words. He will rise up against the house of evildoers and against those who assist sinners. Egypt is man and not God, and their horses are flesh, are of flesh and not of spirit. Hashem will stretch out his hand and the helper will stumble and the helped will fall. They will all perish together. OK, so that's Yeshayahu, Isaiah. What is he saying here? He's saying, woe to those who go down to Egypt for aid. Woe to those who... Rely on the superpower. Egypt was the superpower who rely on horses and trust in chariots. OK, and don't rely on the Holy One of Israel. That's not to say that you don't make your efforts, but you don't rely on it. What do we say? They, meaning the nations of the world, rely on horses and chariots, meaning armaments. And we rely on Hashem. And Yeshayahu, Isaiah, is saying, woe to those who go down to Egypt. So going down to Egypt doesn't necessarily mean physically going down. It means relying on the aid of the superpower. Let me take you to the next one in Yeshayahu. It's a chapter earlier. Let's have a look at this one. Verse, uh, verse uh, 2, 1 and 2, Leon. Woe, O oh wayward sons. The word of Hashem, who take counsel, but not from me, and who accept a ruler, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin upon sin, who are going to descend to Egypt, but did not inquire of my mouth, to seek strength in Pharaoh's stronghold and to take shelter in Egypt's shade. OK, so there you go. You have here uh, another expression here where it's very clear that Yeshayahu, the prophet, is saying, woe to you who descend to Egypt. In other words, who go to, to the superpower of the day, whether it's Egypt or Syria or Babylon or America or Russia or whatever it is. Uh, if you count out to the superpower, 
and don't take notice of Hashem. That is woe to you, says Yeshayahu. Let me just take you back to the third Pasuk here. Verse 3 again, Leon, of chapter 31, please. Egypt is man and not God, and their horses are of flesh, not of spirit. Hashem will stretch out his hand, and the helper will stumble, and the help will fall. They will all perish together. What does that make it sound like? They will all perish together. That sounds like Kriyat Yamsu, doesn't it? That's what happened to the Egyptians eventually after the drowning at the Red Sea, is they all perished together. They all died in, in the, at the Red Sea. So that's an allusion to there. Let me take you, in case you think it was just Yishayahu, let me take you to Malachim Bet, uh, the second Kings, chapter 17, verse 1. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elath, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned for nine years. He did what was evil in the eyes of Hashem albeit not like the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, went up against him, and Hoshea became his vassal and sent him a tribute. Then the king of Assyria discovered that Hoshea had betrayed him, for he had sent messengers to So, the king of Egypt, and he did not send up his tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria arrested him and incarcerated him in prison. OK, let's stop there. So what happened here was this chap called Hoshea, not to be confused with the prophet Hoshea. This is Hoshea, who was a king in the northern kingdom of Israel, um, which uh, he was a vassal state of Assyria. And then he tried to pull a fast one and tried to uh, go down to Egypt. He sent messages to the king of Egypt, King So, the king of Egypt, uh, to get help from Egypt. And what happened was that Shalmanazar, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the king of Assyria, got wind of it, that he was traitorous, and he put him in prison. So again, this is another example where you go down to Egypt for assistance and it doesn't work out. Now, just to confuse you, I'm going to show you some more examples, actually, in a different Hoshea, this time the prophet Hoshea, the book of Hoshea, in chapter 7, verse 11. Ephraim was like a foolish dove with no understanding. They have called to Egypt. They have gone to Assyria. The same idea. They this is, this is the prophet saying that Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom of, of Israel, they went to Egypt. There's another one here in the next chapter, verse 13 in chapter 8. The sacrifices for my burnt offerings, let them slaughter for meat and let them eat. Hashem does not desire them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins, and they will return to Egypt. There you go. So there you are. They return to Egypt. That's their sins is when they return to Egypt. Returning to Egypt means not physically returning to Egypt necessarily. It means being under the patronage of Egypt, asking Egypt to protect you when you should be asking God to protect you. And uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah. Chapter 2 says the following, verse 36. How very much you demean yourself to change your way. You will be shamed even by Egypt as you are shamed by Assyria. From this alliance also you will emerge clapping your hands to your head, for Hashem has rejected your guarantors. You will not succeed with them, saying, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and marries another man, can he return to her again? Would that so, not bring... Let's stop there. So here you have loads of examples here um, where, um, where going down to Egypt is, is forbidden. Asking Egypt for help is forbidden. Somebody's got their hands up. Paul. Yes, Paul. 
These are much later sources, though. And didn't Yerovon, for example, go down to Egypt for, and he was reported there and he came back to be king? Lovely. Thank you for me mentioning that this was a, a, a later sources, because I'm now going to show you an earlier one. Uh, here we are in uh, Devarim, the Torah itself. Devarim chapter 17, we're very familiar with this because these are the psukim we've gone over many, many times about uh, when we've been learning Tanakh because this is the laws of a king. This is when Moshe Rabbeinu tells the people, okay, you, when you have a king, this is what he's got to do. Verse 15, Leon, please. You shall surely set over yourself a king whom Hashem your God shall choose. From among your brethren shall you set a king over yourself. You cannot place over yourself a foreign man who is not your brother. Only he shall not have too many horses for himself so that he will not return the people to Egypt in order to increase horses. For Hashem has said to you, you shall no longer return on this road again. Okay, let's stop there. There you have it, Paul Mufurash in the Torah. You're not allowed to go back to Egypt. Uh, and the reason you're not going to go back to Egypt is to acquire many horses. Horses, of course, uh, in the Torah and in Tanakh de um, designate power. Uh, the horse was the, 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 the animal of, of war. The chariots drawn by the horses uh, was all about power. Uh, and so here, that's the... the uh, the instruction to the king of Israel when it will happen, this is before time, this is Moshe in Dvarim, don't go back to Egypt because Hashem has said, Hashem, Hashem said to you, you will not go down this road again. And there was some famous king who disobeyed. Who was that? Which Roman famous went. king? Again, Roman sorry, Paul. Your Roman men never went down there to uh, Egypt. Yeah, but before before him, it's in Malachim Aleph, chapter ten, verse twenty-eight. Leon. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt, as association of the king's traders would purchase as an association at a set price. A chariot could be bought out of Egypt for 600 pieces of silver and horses for 150. Solomon's traders would also export for all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. Okay, so let's just stop there. Uh, um, Shlomo Amelech was, we know, um, failed. He had a thousand wives. He wasn't allowed to have that. And he had too many horses and he got them from Egypt. Shlomo Amelech. Uh, actually was uh, uh, transgressed Dvarim 17 uh, and uh, there that, and he was strongly criticized for that. Um, here's another uh, expression in the Torah itself, chapter 28 of Dvarim, uh, verse 68. This is in Parshat Kitavo, the end of the Tochacha, the end of the rebuke. Verse... 68. 68. Hashem will return you to Egypt in ships on the road of which I said to you, you shall never again see it. And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as slaves and maidservants. But there will be no buyer. Okay, so there you go. Uh, uh, this is the end of the Tolchacha. The biggest punishment that we can get, the biggest possible punishment that we can get is we'll go back to Egypt and we'll try and, uh, and be slaves to them. We'll try and ingratiate ourselves to the, the Egyptians. But you know what? They won't want us. There will be no buyer. This is the worst thing that can possibly happen. This is at the end of the Tolchacha, the end of the rebuke. Uh, uh, Moshe is saying to the people, if you don't keep the Torah, you're going to get all these terrible curses. We don't need to go into them. What's gone on before the, the psukim before this, all sorts of dreadful things. And at the end of it, what will happen is you'll end up getting taken in, uh, into slavery, into Egypt. And even they won't want you. That's how bad you'll be. So going back to Egypt, it's like the worst possible 
uh, thing that you can possibly do. Um, and uh, again here uh, in Dvarim, I think this is also in Dvarim. This is Dvarim chapter 17. Again, that's our, our um, uh, same pass that we had before. Um, so there we go. All of those things are telling us that going back to Egypt um, means three different things. It means physically going back to Egypt. Chizkiyahu uh, HaMelech went physically back to Egypt um, when he was threatened. No, he didn't. When he was threatened by Sancheriv, uh, um, he uh, asked Egypt for help. Um, the second thing is physical emigration to Egypt. And the third thing um, is to live under Egyptian uh, uh, vassal rule. In other words, to be subservient to the superpower. And so the, uh, we now look at the we, we now return back to the story of Shemot, of, of the Exodus, of Pesach. And we can ask our question, what was the point of Pesach? What is the point of Pesach? The point of Pesach, the point of Yitziat Mitzrayim, was not just a physical removal from slavery. It was a total uh, independence of spirit, independence of Egypt completely, not to be reliant on them, neither for their physical uh, well-being or where they lived, uh, nor for their support. They did not, uh, they were not to be a vassal state. They were not to be uh, going up to the, the, the uh, Eretz Canaan through this way here with their letter of safe passage. No, they had to see uh, Mitzrayim Metal Sfatayam. They had to see that they were finished. Egypt was finished as far as the Bnei Israel were concerned. Bnei Israel were totally independent of Egypt. They were independent of Egypt's gods. They were independent of Egypt's king. They were independent of Egypt's money. They were independent of Egypt's horses. They were independent of Egypt Bichlal, completely. And then, and only then, and then and only then, were they in a fit state to go down this red path here and come to Mount Sinai and get the Torah. Only a people who are completely in tune with uh, God, as opposed to being subservient to another people, were fitting to get the Ten Commandments. What do we say in the beginning of the Ten Commandments? I am God who took you out of Egypt. That's the whole point. I took you out of Egypt so that I will be your God and only I will be your God. That's why the Ten Commandments begins with Anochi Hashem. It's not, a, it's not a command that you have to do that. It's a statement of fact. Everything else that comes beyond this time, in other words, the whole of the Torah, is predicated on the fact that Anochi Hashem Hashem Etchem Mitzrayim. I am God who took you out of Mitzrayim completely, completely, not just physically, but mentally and also spiritually and also financially, and also in terms of power. So here we see that there was a very short period of time in history, we've said it many, many times before, where we fulfilled the criteria where we could receive the Torah. Because you can only receive the Torah when you are in a state of Anochi Hashem Elokech Hashem Tzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzitzit
and we'd seen them by Yah Yisrael at Mitzrayim, Metal Spatayam. We saw them dead on the, the on the shore. Why? Because we saw it with our own eyes. We didn't just hear it; we saw it, and therefore we could believe it. Seeing is believing. So we were completely independent of them, and then we could be completely dependent on a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That was a short period of time into history. Fast forward, we went into Eretz Canaan. We had a short period of time up until the Assyrian Empire, up until the end of uh, uh, the, not long after the, the death of Shlom Melech, we had the splitting of the two uh, kingdoms. And then we, we are under the, the kosh of, uh, a, uh, of a, uh, an empire, whether it was the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medes, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottomans, the British, until 1948, and we're no longer under anybody's kosh. Right? So what is the point of Pesach? The point of Pesach is to, for us to reach a situation that we are, Baruch Hashem, in today. And not many generations in the whole of history have been able to say that. There was this short period of time where we were wandering around here and we got this Mount Sinai. And then there was a short period of time during the, 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 the time of the, of the, uh, of the kings, of, da of David and Solomon. But then it was pretty much it. Then we had a few years on the Bar Kokhba, but that wasn't much cop and last very long. Um, and then we had a few years of the Maccabees. Right. Not really very, uh, very auspicious. And then nothing, nothing until 1948. Nothing until 1948. So then we can see, what is the point of Pesach? The point of Pesach is total independence from superpowers. And you can see what happens when you rely on superpowers, when you rely on everybody else. I'm reminded, I, 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 I tried to find it, but I ran out of time this morning. I tried to find it. There's a brilliant uh, clip somewhere on YouTube of Menachem Begin, who's 30th, uh, Yorta, it was just uh, um, not long ago, I think uh, a week or two ago. Um, Menachem Begin speaking to um, uh, the American Senate, uh, and basically he was asking for, for arms or what have you. And he basically said, Well, look, you know, if you give it to us, all well and good. And if you don't, fine, we'll manage without you because we are the Jewish people and we are always uh, uh, going to uh, survive because God has promised us that we will survive. It was a most wonderful speech, and uh, I, I couldn't find it. But uh, if I if I if I find it, I'll put it out on, on one of the groups. But this is what he was. He more than anybody else understood that that we were not to be subservient to any power, whether it be a superpower of the day like Egypt or any other power. We have to be masters of our own destiny. We have to be independent of other people and dependent on a Kaddish Baruch Hu. and that ladies and gentlemen, is the point of Pesach. Thank you, Johnny. Any questions? No. Thank you. At the end of the Shema, we say it twice a day. Yeah, we went, we, we went yesterday through, in the Shia yesterday, uh, we went through uh, uh, how many different mitzvot are connected to uh, to Yisrael uh, Mitzrayim, Tfilin, Tzitzit, uh, uh, weights and measures, all of these things being nice to, 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 to people. Remember, don't be horrible to the stranger because you were a stranger in a foreign land and I took you out of Egypt. All of these mitzvot, many, many, many of the mitzvot are connected to Yitziat Mitzrayim. Um, and uh, uh, um, so there we go. It's all part of, of, of being a, a, an independent Jew. Yes, Marcel. My list of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Uh, yes, so Marcel's done a list of billions of places where Yitziat Mitzrayim is mentioned in the Torah and in the Haggadah. Um, it, it, I think I think Benton needs to get you to be doing some cleaning, Marcel, because you've obviously <laughs> got too much time on your hand uh, <laughs> to go through all this in such great detail. Uh, amazing work that Marcel has done, uh, finding hundreds of places where Yitziat Mitzrayim is mentioned. It is the <laughs> fundamental part of, of, of Judaism, the most fundamental part of Judaism, uh, is Yitziat Mitzrayim, and the point of it, what is the point of it? The point of it is that we become an independent nation. And again, you'll all be sick of me saying this, but I'm going to say it again. How fortunate are we in our generation that we are fulfilling 
that in as the best possible way we can do so for over 3,000 years. It's absolutely remarkable. Yes, Sharon. Um, first of all, I hope that you will uh, uh, remember to send us the appropriate place for the fifth cup of wine. Yes, that's on my list of things to oh, do. Okay. And the second thing is, you know, it's, it's so impressive to me looking at, at, at what you, the sources you've brought. Yes, it's so important that we know that we are only servants of Hashem. But what is equally important, I think, that you brought out in this is that we're not uh, bowed, craven, and broken uh, servants, but that we have to come from a, a strength and an independence and an individuality um, so that we are servants and yet partners. So I'm not sure, you know, we, we talk about servants, but I think that uh, so much of this is the quality of a partner uh, that the Jewish people has to have. Uh, and that comes from this kind of independence and from uh, forward looking, not backward looking. I, I, I think that's right. And I think that you know, I mentioned Menachem Begin earlier on. I think Menachem Begin, or certainly for me, um, epitomized that, uh, that strength that uh, demonstrated that, that uh, we were uh, an independent, we are independent in his day and when in his negotiations, he was negotiating from a position of independent strength and not a position of uh, kowtowing. Uh, and in terms of our relationship with God, with Hashem, well, of course, that's an individual, uh, uh, different, different people at, at approach that in different ways. There are people who, who uh, are able uh, to uh, completely um, subsume themselves to God's will, as it were, and just let the life flow over them and God will take me where he wants to take me. There are others who are more, uh, um, more sort of um, independent spirit, if you like. Uh, but nevertheless, we need to be uh, always guided by the, 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 the power above us and not the power around us. I think that's, uh, that's certainly the truth. Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I hope that you will uh, join me again tomorrow morning for uh, Rabbi Wise's uh, uh, Shior. Uh, Mr. Can, can you spare some change? Uh, and uh, those of you who can speak Hebrew or at least understand Hebrew, please come tonight and support uh, the Sheol with Rav Kalman Bear. Shabbat <laughs> Tov, everyone. Shabbat Tov, Johnny. Thank you. Johnny, you're going to record tomorrow, tonight, are you? Tonight, so you're going to be on Zoom also. Uh, what, tonight? Yeah. I uh, wasn't planning it, but I suppose I could. Right, Johnny, are you going to record tomorrow? Yes. Because I'm, I'll actually be flying out tomorrow, so I won't be able to listen to it live anyway. I, I will record it, um, please, Blinada, and uh, uh, if Avril's there, she'll remind me, um, and by then I'll, I'll send it out, the recording out, as I usually do. Thank you. Okay, Shavuot to everyone. Shavuot Thank you, Johnny.